um, this exhibition um, is implicated um, is has raised very contentious issues, particularly relating to representation, um, that were particularly evident in the series of documentary films that we've screened to date. Um, and if the issue of how the situation is represented in terms of documentary, where the filmmaker admits their own bias as an individual author, um, the stakes are obviously a lot higher um, in the medium where the claim is made to, um, to truth or objectivity, um, namely the news. Um, fortunately, uh, we have tonight two speakers um, who are able to uh, allow us to discuss some of those issues in depth and with balance. Um, unfortunately, Zahara Harb has been unable to make it this evening. Um, if the news didn't reach you, um, she was called away on quite urgent university business and to send her apologies to us all. Um, but I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers. Um, First of all, Mike Berry, who is a lecturer in film, culture and media at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Nottingham. His research interests are focused around the question of how mass media affects public knowledge and understanding of social and political issues. And he's published extensively in the area of news reporting in Israel-Palestine. His recent publications, which he's going to discuss, um, include Bad News from Israel and Israel-Palestine Contested Histories. We'll begin the evening with Mike giving a, a presentation of about 20 minutes that connects to this research. And um, in response to Mike's research and opening into um, a wider discussion, we're very pleased to welcome back to Nottingham Contemporary for the second time, Razia Iqbal, the BBC's arts correspondent from 2003 to 2009. She's currently a special correspondent for the BBC continuing to report on a variety of foreign and domestic stories for BBC News programmes on television and radio. She joined the BBC in 1989 and has reported extensively on radio and television from culture to domestic politics and has been a reporter for the BBC in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. So I'm going to pass over now to Mike, um, who will present on his research. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank the... Um the gallery for inviting us down here to speak today. I'm going to say I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes about some of the research um, that I conducted on media coverage of the conflict, particularly on the broadcast media coverage of the conflict, and also look at what our research said about how it actually affected public understanding and public debate about about the conflict. So, essentially. When I try and do research, I try to look at what we call the circuit of communication. So we're interested at one end how messages are produced in the media, so the context in which journalists operate, the various constraints that they operate under. We're interested in the, the, the content of, of media messages, and we're also interested in how they're received by audiences, whether audiences choose to, res to accept um, or reject messages, and what are the conditions under which they um, accept or reject messages. So, what we're essentially interested at when we look at content is what we call a thematic analysis. We're interested in how things are explained. And in areas, in, in most areas of um, controversy, there will be alternative ways of explaining social reality. So when you look at a very, very deep, long-standing and contested conflict such as the Israel-Palestine conflict, there are different ways of explaining events. And the way that those events are actually explained is key to how audiences actually understand them. Okay. So the study I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk for the main part about the first study. There were two studies. And I'm, at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the second study. So the first study we looked at was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, and we looked, as I say, particularly at television news. We looked at the main mass audience bulletins, which are the bulletins at 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. on BBC and ITV. The reason we focus on those particular bulletins are because there's a great deal of research, and it was backed up by our own research, that these are the key bulletins that affect public understanding. So around 80% of the population rely on the evening news on television for their picture of what goes on in the world, particularly internationally. And it's also true that television news is a much more trusted news source, for instance, than newspapers. So not only is it watched by more people, it's also seen to have a higher truth value. 
So we analysed about 200 uh, mass audience bulletins on uh, BBC and ITV. We also gave questionnaires to um, 800 individuals. We're interested in trying to pick, get a picture of what people knew about the conflict. So these are some of the questions that we asked. This first research I'm talking about we did between 2000 and 2004 during the period of the um, second uh, intifada. Um, we also did a, a number of focus groups with um, audience members. F focus groups allow you to get deeper information, richer, qualitative information about how people actually understand issues. Okay. So they allow you, somebody might say, well, I think the conflict's about land. Okay. But if you're in a focus group, you can then ask a probing question, what do you mean by land? And that allows you to kind of unpack the way people think. So by, by combining focus groups with questionnaires, you build up a kind of a, a, a richer understanding of how people actually understand the conflict and how that's affected by their consumption of media. It also, quite interesting, allows you to um, look at what we describe as the dynamic structure of audience beliefs and how people's beliefs and attitude sometimes change when they come into contact with new forms of information and, and new, new pieces of knowledge. Okay. We also use what's called a news writing exercise where we give people photographs and we get them to reconstruct the news. This allows us to evaluate what people have actually retained from watching the news and how the structures of thought and the structures of responsibility and, and legitimation are actually formed um, in their heads. Okay. Um, and we also, during our studies, got quite a lot of strong input from, from uh, journalists. So we brought working journalists from BBC and independent television together and got them to sit in with our, our focus groups of ordinary members of the public. So we were interested in getting journalists to think about how the way they reported actually affected public understanding and knowledge. So um, the purpose was essentially not to criticise individual journalists or, or, or to bash broadcasters, but more to kind of start a debate and get, and, and, and get um, the media to think about how the way they structured their output actually affected public knowledge and understanding. Okay. So in our analysis of, 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 of news um, coverage of the Intifada, one of, one of the key things we, we found was that a great deal of the coverage was on decontextualized images of violence and conflict. So this, uh, this accounted, when we actually transcribed news text, to about 28% of the total lines of text. Okay? And when we spoke to ordinary members of the public, this is what they tended to take from coverage of the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's, it's bombs, it, it's killing, it's blood, it's, it's suicide bombings, etc., etc. Okay? What we also found was that there was very, very little explanation about why the two sides were actually in conflict. Okay? And one of the reasons for this, a journalist told us, a BBC journalist told us, that he was told by his news editor not to concentrate on what he called explainers or, or background context, but instead to concentrate on what they call bang-bang. Okay? So very, very immediate images of conflict. And the purpose of this, we were told, was in a very, very competitive news environment, was to try and grab the audience and to hold the audience. Okay? Um, George Alagaya said to us that I'm constantly being told by my news editors that the average attention span of an audience member is about 10 seconds. And if you don't grab them, they'll switch over. So the news gets pushed in that direction towards more kind of immediacy and less explanation and less context. Okay. Um, unfortunately, as I'll, I'll explain a little, little bit later on, this kind of coverage tends to leave people very, very confused. And also, kind of paradoxically, in an ironic sense, rather than drawing people in, it eventually leads people to actually switching off the television because, they, uh, because it all just seems as well. I think one of the people in our focus groups said to us, it all seems like a big bloody mess that I don't understand. What we also found, as I say, with the lack of context, was that television news contains almost nothing about the history or origins of the Israel-Palestine conflict. So in our first sample, which looked at about 3,500 lines of news text, only 17 lines mentioned anything about the history of the conflict. When we went back and looked at um, previous coverage looking at the, the Oslo peace process, we, we found a similar pattern. And it's very interesting how if you go back or you, you look at different patterns, these, these things are quite static. Okay? There is a tendency that goes back a long period of time for just to avoid 
presenting information about the background, the history, and the context of the conflict. And what you find when you talk to ordinary members of the public is that this absence of historical information is, is very, very closely mirrored in, in, in audience members' understanding. Okay? So only about 4 to 19 percent of our British samples were aware that the Palestinian refugees were created uh, when Israel itself came into being in 1948. And some thought they'd come from places like Kosovo or Afghanistan. And, and most people weren't aware of any of the wars in the history of the wars in the region, or the links, for instance, between the 1948 and the 1967 conflicts. Um, there was enormous confusion amongst ordinary members of the public over basic facts about the conflict. So in some groups, we found that uh, more people thought it was the Palestinians rather than the Israelis who were the settlers, and that it was the Palestinians rather than the Israelis who were actually occupying the occupied territories. And many people without a grasp of the historical background were aware that the Palestinians had, had lost land in previous conflicts. So this is um, from one of our student groups in Glasgow. The impression I got was the Palestinians had lived around the area, and now they're trying to come back and get some more land for themselves. I didn't realise they'd actually been driven out. I thought they didn't want to live as part of Israel, and that they, they wanted to kind of form their own sort of self-governing place. Okay. A very, very common perception of the conflict was effectively it was a border dispute between two states. I didn't realise there was a geography of Palestine. Being, I thought there was Palestine, there was Israel, and they were fighting over a bit of land in the middle. And part of the um, reason for this is the context of the occupation is not very, very well or very comprehensively explained on television. Okay. So this idea of it being a border dispute was a very, very common perception about members from members of the audience. Okay. When there were explanations given for why the conflict was going on, they were often provided in a quite oblique way, in a form of shorthand, which assumed that the people in the audience Knew as, much of the knew as much as the journalists actually did about the history of the region and the conflict. So there was kind of an unwillingness to actually go into any kind of explanation about how, how, how the situation had come to the situation it was in and why the two sides were still fighting. So here's some examples from um, ITV and BBC News. They haven't even started to tackle the most serious issues yet. These include the future of Jewish settlements, the future of Jerusalem, of Palestinian refugees, and the shape of Israel's final borders. Now, all these are true, but you have to go back a little bit and actually unpack them and explain why they're important, how they came about. And obviously, this is very, very difficult within the context of a short news bulletin. But there is a challenge here for journalists in this area to actually try and find one way, as Brian Hanrahan said to us, of drip-feeding in context in order to make the, the conflict more intelligible to uh, members of the audience. Okay. We also found that there was very little in coverage about the social and economic consequences of the Israeli military occupation. So there was almost no information about the loss of homes, land and water, nor some of the criticisms that Israel has been subject to regarding um, human rights abuses. So there's little information about um, international law or the large number of um, UN resolutions which have been critical of the occupation. And the key thing that this did when we talked to people in the audience is, is it kind of removed the Palestinian rationale for action. People could under, couldn't understand why the two, two groups were still fighting. People would say to us, um, are they just bad neighbours or something? Well, I mean, why, why is this conflict going on? Do they just not get on or something? So effectively you had removed by not talking about some of these issues, you'd, you'd kind of remove, the, certainly from the Palestinian perspective, the rationale for why they were actually acting this way. Okay. As I say, and when you actually looked at the audience, you found these, these absences of, of discussion of things like human rights um, and what the occupation actually involved, very, very closely mirrored in audience understandings. So when we spoke to people, only about 2% of the people in our sample raised human rights as an issue in the conflict, only about 9% were aware that water was an important factor. And there was an awful lot of confusion about what the term occupation actually meant. Because the, the military aspect of the occupation in which one population is effectively controlled by the other wasn't discussed um, in a comprehensive way. People were very confused about what occupation meant. Most people thought that it just meant somebody was there 
like an, a bathroom being occupied, that it just meant somebody was there. They didn't realise the, the, the kind of web of control that it actually um, had on, on, on one population in the conflict. So, without any kind of background or historical conflict, or virtually none, um, we found that a lot of the reporting tended to focus around immediate day-to-day -day issues. And here we found two very clear ex explanatory patterns in conflict. One was essentially that this was a, a tit-for-tat violence, or that it was a cycle of violence. So violence was pre presented as a, as a self-perpetuating cycle that had taken on a life of its own. Okay. Paul Adams, the BBC correspondent, said to us, it's presented as a constant procession of grief. It's covered as if it's a very, very large blood feud. Unless there's a large amount of blood, it's not covered. Okay? But you can't essentially explain conflicts by saying one person attacked on Tuesday and then the other person attacked on Wednesday. You couldn't explain the Second World War by saying that Britain bombed Germany and Germany bombed Britain. You would have to sort of step back and actually provide some of the context and the background to the day-to-day -day events. The other, the second pattern that we found, aside from the talking about it as a kind of a cycle of violence, was the notion of Palestinian action and Israeli retaliation. So we found um, in our news reports that the Israelis were describing as responding or retaliating to what was done to them by Palestinians about six times as often as Palestinians were described as retaliating to what had been done to them by the Israelis. And this action retaliation framework really strongly affected the way ordinary people saw the conflict. Okay? So people would think that, that the Israelis were always retaliating to what had been done to them by the Palestinians, and there was a perception that the Israelis were fighting back and that the Palestinians had started the, the whole conflict and, and were constantly starting um, all the problems. Okay. And when we did the news writing exercise where we gave people photos and got them to reconstruct the news, we found this framework appearing again and again. Okay. And these are some of the um, actual transcripts which were produced by um, people in our audience groups. So we gave them photos, for instance, of the, the aftermath of a suicide bombing um, or, or, or a tank in, um, in, 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 in a part of the occupied territory. And people would then write their own news stories. And you saw this, this idea that the Israelis retaliated to what was done to them by the Palestinians, reoccurring again and again in this news writing exercise, because people had internalized this framework of understanding. Okay. This was very, very interesting in, in relation to one of the most controversial um, events of the, um, the Second Intifada, the, the killing of a young Palestinian boy, Mohammed al-Dura. And the killing itself um, actually took place quite close to the time that two Israeli reserve soldiers were killed in the occupied territories by Palestinians. And when we actually gave the photos to people in the audience, the, the killing of Mohammed al-Jura actually took place before the killing of the, the two Israeli soldiers. But when we gave the pictures to people in the audience, they actually reversed the sequence of events and presented the killing of the boy as a form of retaliation against the actual killing of the Israeli soldiers. Okay. So you can see this is from one of um, the uh, focus groups. And so this, 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 this whole framework that people had internalized of attack and retaliation actually caused them to reverse the sequence of events, which I thought was very, very interesting. Okay. We also found there was a very strong emphasis on Israeli perspective. So Israeli officials were given twice as much space as Palestinian um, officials. And this imbalance also tended to be magnified by the fact that there was a strong prominence of American spokesmen who tended to be very supportive of the Israeli position. And there was no attempt to kind of balance this by providing um, uh, sources who were supportive of the Palestinians, perhaps from the wider Arab or Muslim world. Um, and sometimes we found that um, some of the Israeli perspectives were directly endorsed by journalists. Um, there's a difference between journalists obviously saying, um, this, is, this is how the Israelis see it, this is how the Palestinians see it, this is how it is. Okay? But we found sometimes that in the conflict, journalists did directly endorse one particular perspective on the conflict. There are two clear perspectives on the way the conflict should be seen, an Israeli and a Palestinian one. And all we argue in our research is essentially that if you're going to have a proper debate about it and, and if reporting is going to be balanced, you need to provide both sides of the story because there are clearly two different narratives about the conflict. Okay. 
Okay. Here's another one from the um, Wire Chords where um, one of the journalists there, Stephen Sacker, is asked what are the main obstacles to peace and effectively he provides the Israeli perspective on what the main obstacles to peace are, that they're all about um, security guarantees and arresting militants. And obviously Palestinians wouldn't see that from this perspective at all. Um, you could also see this tendency some, to often um, favour the Israeli policy, uh, perspective. It could be seen in controversial instances. As I say, going back to the Mohammed al-Dura killing, the Palestinians certainly saw that killing as a deliberate act. Right? The Israelis argued that it was accidental that the boy had been killed in the crossfire. And what we found when we looked at the coverage was that the Israeli perspective that this was, this was an accident and the, and the boy had merely been killed in the crossfire um, predominated in coverage. Okay, so when there was a, a contested account of a particular event, we did find that the Israeli account was featured much more prominently. Okay. Um, and when we looked at the news writing exercise, ordinary members of the public had internalised this and they actually reproduced these news reports in a very, very accurate way. This was very interesting. Um, we also found that the Israeli perspective on settlements also predominated. Um, certainly if you look at respectable historians like um, Avi Schleim, he's written very, very conclusively about how the settlements have a key role in the maintenance of the occupation. They were, they were built high on, on hilltops in order to um, dominate the Palestinians in the valleys below. And they were also built high on hilltops in order to gain strategic control of land and water resources. They've also been heavily criticised by Israeli um, human rights groups um, for, um, for harassing and for violence against Palestinians in order to try and get the Palestinians to leave so the settlers can take their land. However, when we um, looked at media coverage of the settlements, we found that the, that the Israeli perspective, that effectively these were just vulnerable communities under threat from terrorists and mobs, tended to predominate. Okay? And this view uh, and, and the coverage actually rarely featured information about the role of the settlements in the occupation and the fact that, that they're widely seen under international law as being illegal. Okay. So from the BBC, one regular target for Palestinian gunmen is the Israeli settlement. It's intensely vulnerable, high on a hill, surrounded on all sides by Palestinian territory. Actually, I mean, they don't actually say that under international law it's actually seen as on Palestinian territory. Strangely enough, it, it's surrounded by Palestinian territory. Okay. And when we actually talked to ordinary members of the public, we found this was the kind of view that, strangely enough, they'd also internalised. Okay. So this is what they thought of as of settlements. I think you sometimes get the impression that these people happen to just want to live there and the military backup is in pursuit of their peaceful wish to want to go. That's the impression that I got rather than it being a military occupation. Okay. And some of the people in, that we spoke to, all members of the public, were very shocked to find out that these settlements controlled a huge part of the occupied territories, nearly 40%. This is from a middle class male in Glasgow. I had no idea I was gobsmacked. I saw them as small and battled and surrounded by Holocaust Palestinians. That's entirely thanks to watching television news. Okay. And you could see when people come into contact with different kinds of information, this particular person had seen a, a John Pil Pilger documentary on the settlements, the way that it challenged what they'd actually seen on the news and, and caused them to kind of revise their, um, their view on the conflict. We also found other things such as the fact that during the conflict there was more ca coverage actually given to Israeli casualties even though the Palestinians during the Second Intifada um, were dying at a much higher level. Okay? And this affected audience beliefs so that for instance in um, one of our samples about 40% of the sample thought that actually the Israelis had more casualties or that they were approximately equal, though during virtually the whole of the Intifada it was about four to one in terms of um, the level of casualties between the two sides. There was also different language used by um, broadcasters for the deaths on each side. So for instance, um, the words like murder, um, uh, lynching, um, uh, some of the words that were used. Just want to actually just go back a minute. 
One of the things we looked at, I, I mentioned before about the killing of the, the two Israeli reservists who had gone into Ramallah. Around the same time, 13 Israeli Arabs were killed um, in Tel Aviv, Jaffa, and, and um, Bat Yam. It was, this was described um, as a pogrom by an Israeli peace group, um, and um, it was reported very critically in parts of the press. Um, when we actually looked at how it was reported on television news, it was reported in a much more... Um, euphemistic way. Um, passions on all sides were still running high. Even in Tel Aviv, violence had now hit the streets. There were angry Jews looking for Arab victims. Okay? Some Israeli citizens are taking matters into their own hands. Last night, a Jewish mob attacked uh, a mosque in the city of Tiberias. However, when we looked at the killing of two Israelis, there was a very, very different kind of language that was used to describe the killing of the Israelis. It was also highlighted in coverage via headlines, Here's some examples from BBC One. A frenzied mob. Um, Israeli soldiers arrested and the mob were baying for blood. Um, Palestinians could be seen savagely beating and stabbing soldiers to death. Okay? They'd been barbarically killed. Now, people were killed in horrific ways by both sides in this conflict. But what we found was there was certainly a difference in emphasis and a difference in language to describe the deaths of Palestinians as opposed to Israelis. So certain words like atrocity, murder, lynch mob, and barbarically killed were used to describe the deaths of Israelis but not Palestinians. Okay? Different language used to describe both sides in the conflict. Israelis, we found, were described as soldiers, troops, brothers in arms. Okay? When a settler group was reported as trying to bomb a Palestinian school, they were described as vigilantes. But as you can see, the kind of used words that were used to describe Palestinians were very, very different. Another interesting thing we found when we looked at it, and I'm kind of entering the last sort of five minutes of the talk, and I'm going to wrap it up quite soon, was that the role of the United States was spoken in quite a euphemistic way throughout the coverage. It tended to be portrayed as, a, as an honest broker trying to bring the two sides together. There was little mention of the fact that the, the United States actually armed one side in the conflict and supported one side. And this left people very, very confused about the role of the United States. So one of the, the, the questions we asked is why, why might the Palestinians burn an Israeli flag? And people would say, um, is it because the Palestinians support the Taliban? People were very, very confused. And this lack of information about basic facts about the conflict left people just enormously bewildered. What we also found was that interest in, in following the story was closely, leveled, was closely related to their level of understanding. So the more people understood the context and the background, the more they were interested in following the story and getting more involved. Okay? But what you needed to do in order to, to, to grab people's attention was actually to provide what was missing, which was the context, the background, and the little bit of the history. Okay. And after we'd, we'd, we'd provided some of the information about the various background and the fact there had been a war in 1948, a lot of the people in our audience groups were fascinated and wanted to know more. What we did find as well was that essentially decontextualised images of violence lead people to turn off the television. People just become... It, it's just distressing. And if they don't understand it, they don't really want to watch because they don't really feel any close sense of involvement. Okay. I really want to kind of finish off this section by just talking about why the coverage is like this. Okay? And this is what the journalist told us. The need to maximise audiences drives coverage away from explanation and, and to more dramatic imagery, stuff that's immediate, trying to pull people in. Okay? In the age of 24-hour news broadcasts as well, news journalists are having to service lots and lots of different outlets, different outlets at the BBC, broadcast, television, radio, and because of the fact they have to service so many different parts of the, of, of, of the broadcast of, of TV and radio, they have less time for researching the stories and actually getting deeper into the story. Okay? The fact that the history of the conflict is very much con contested means that it's, it makes it more difficult to actually provide context because you need to provide the kind of Israeli and Palestinians accounts of the history. A key thing that we've been talked about was Israeli public relations has been much more effective in actually driving the news agenda to cover their particular perspective on the conflict. And finally, um, issues such as the fact that most 
journalists are based in East West Jerusalem, sorry. And also that a lot of the, the broadcasters have said that they come under treme tremendous pressure from organised lobbying in order to present um, a particular version of the conflict and to actually kind of exclude certain perspectives. That was kind of the first study. I just want to talk for a couple of final minutes about the second set of studies we did. We also did some studies um, around the Gaza war in 2009. And what we found, interestingly enough, was exact, almost exactly the same kind of pattern of reporting. A very, very strong um, emphasis on Israeli perspectives and very, very little uh, uh, on the Palestinian perspective on the Gaza war. So for instance, we found hundreds and hundreds of lines about the Israeli perspective that they needed to stop the rockets, but almost nothing about the fact that the Palestinians were, were, were under a kind of military blockade, and that this very, very severely affected um, their, their human rights and their ability to actually um, to live a normal life. So that was largely absent. There was also no real mention of the fact that um, uh, the fact that the that that um, the Palestinians had actually offered to, to stop all the rockets attacks if the blockade had, had been lifted. So the alternative account, which actually stressed um, that there was an alternative to the war, which the Israelis were trying to present that there wasn't really an alternative to war to stop the rockets, wasn't presented, and it wasn't put to the um, Israeli spokespersons themselves. Um, you did find a lot, as in the report of the Intifada, you did find a lot of information regarding um, Palestinian casualties, about Palestinian suffering and deaths, and some very sympathetic coverage. But whenever we found um, there was information about Palestinian suffering and death in, in the Gaza war, it was, all, it was always balanced by the Israeli rationale for, for why they were actually doing this. So they would show the Palestinian casualties, and often these were very, very distressing, but this would always be almost always next to a, a statement from the Israelis about why they actually had to conduct this. And what we found when we actually did audience groups on this, in this area as well was that, generally speaking, the, the, the ordinary members of the public um, weren't aware that there was an option of actually um, having a truce and stopping the rocket attacks if the siege had been lifted, and also, they tended to blame the Palestinians because they thought the Palestinians had all brought it on themselves by actually doing the rockets. And there was no real um, awareness amongst most people that they were actually living under a form of siege um, in which um, the, their, their, their access to the outside world was blocked and there were serious social consequences for this. Okay, I think I'll probably talk for about 25 minutes. I've gone a bit over my time, so I'll probably um, wrap it up now. And um, pass it over to. Uh... Thank you very much, um, Mike. And um, I just want to say thank you very much for, to, to all of you for, for coming, because I think it's just extraordinary that you've all turned out on a, what are we, Wednesday evening? Um, I, fascinating research, Mike, because it just seems to me to, the, the things that occur to me immediately are two things. From the point of view of broadcasters, um, including the BBC, obviously, being one of, one of the biggest. They, they would probably argue that they come under quite a lot of pressure from Israelis saying that they're not sympathetic to the Israeli side. Uh -huh. and, and yet what you're saying for the ordinary members of the public who are the reason why the BBC exists, uh -huh. that we're actually failing them. That we're, that, I mean, that seems to be the underlying conclusion of, of, of what you, all the research that you've done, that we've, we've fundamentally failed to explain the story effectively. It certainly left a lot of people confused. The bulk of the people in the audience are just fundamentally confused about um, basic facts about the, um, about the conflict. And this isn't because people don't watch the news, because in the news writing exercise we actually get an opportunity, because people write their own news reports, we give them photographs and they, and they get to write their own news reports. So we get to see what they've actually taken from news. And the really astonishing thing is how close the, the, the things they actually write are to actual news reports. So all the people have actually seen the news reports, they've lodged in their mind, they can remember them, but they're utterly confused about the most basic facets of, of the conflict. And this is largely due to the fact that there's a, an unwillingness to explain, particularly the, the Palestinian perspective on why the conflict is going on. There isn't really that much explanation of, 
I mean, there's, there's a lot more explanation of the Israeli um, perspective, but there really isn't hardly any explanation about why the two sides are fighting or how it could realistically, the conflict could be brought to an end. And that's really, really fundamental because it, it prevents there being an opportunity to actually have a rational public debate about how we might actually bring the conflict to an end. I, I wonder if, if, if we can just explore some of the things that you some of the things that you you've been talking about because it seems to me that there is on the one side you know your focus is the audience and the public's understanding of this incredibly contentious issue. And on the other side are reporters who are, if, even if we put to one side the pressures that reporters are under, the, the, the obligation of the reporter to merely report what they see. And, 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 and what many reporters would argue is, even if you say that it's weighted one way uh -huh. or the other, on the day of a particular event, their job is just to show what happened on that day. And you could argue that Brian Hanrahan's mm -hmm. notion of the kind of drip, drip uh -huh. contextualization will happen over a period of time. And you're saying it just really doesn't. Well, we, we looked at over a very, very... I mean, we, we analysed 200 bulletins over four years and there just wasn't any context at all, virtually. The shocking statistic for me was the 3,500 lines, 17 lines of context. I mean, that just kind of made me go, whoa. I, I do also have to say that um, I do remember a while ago sitting watching BBC News 24 and there's a segment on there where... The BBC makes great play about that we don't just do the how, why and what, but we do very, very interesting. The key question that we want to ask is the why. And this is what's kind of missing the why. Why are these two sides fighting? Why is this conflict so bitter and, uh, and intractable? Why can't we bring it to a resolution? And, and what really would need to be done in order to... To, to, to bring the conflict to an end, and the BBC really does pride itself on on this whole th this whole notion that it's there to to explain, um, you know, events in the world. But we really have to say in this area. It, it, it doesn't seem to have explained it very, very well at all. Do you think, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not here to defend the BBC um, in, in, the, in the context of the research that you've done, but I, but I do think, you know, having worked on the 6 o'clock news and the 10 o'clock news, the, the, you know, they're, they're 25 minute bulletins, Absolutely. which have to serve an audience that predominantly has uh, an interest in national stories. Okay, so, for, so foreign stories, by their very nature, will not get onto those bulletins uh -huh. unless they are really big. You know, and we've seen that shift massively over the last year with the Arab Spring. And, and generally, post 9-11, the you know prevailing interest in in what happens beyond our borders is is much more compelling to editors and because it has because it affects us and so they're making the connections much more but i just wonder whether there is a there is a case to be made that 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 you it, you know, when you've got those very, very short bulletins, you know, should should the responsibility of the broadcaster be to have longer stories on, say, uh -huh. a foreign story? You know, say, because a lot of these bulletins, you know, and I know from having been a reporter, you, you're lucky if you get two and a half minutes per story. Okay, two and a half minutes for a story is a long time. Normally, say it's somebody, you know, a horrible murder, say, in Nottingham. A minute and a half is what you'd get on the six o'clock news. Okay, a foreign story, two and a half minutes, possibly three if it was specially commissioned, a lot of money went into it, it was invested with, you know, resources, etc. Three minutes is not very long to include no. a big chunk of historical Absolutely. context, however much as a reporter you might want to include it. Absolutely. All I would say in terms of that is that... Um Often these bulletins weren't only three minutes. Often these were extended bulletins of, of, of segments of up to ten minutes just because of the fact that this story was on day after day after right. day. And the Israel-Palestine conflict is um, one of the most, probably the most heavily reported foreign story when you actually think about the number of people who are involved. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, sometimes it has a number of what I think are sometimes called news values in terms of issues like um, it's the centre of three of the key religions um, in three of the world's key religions um, there's also obviously a large constituents in Britain of both um, Muslims um, and Jews who are very very interested in the story it's seen as an incredibly important regional flashpoint and also most importantly the because of the, 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 the constant conflict, it produces an endless stream of dramatic images that, that draw 
the, 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 the broadcasters there. And obviously, it's also seen as a key beat there, so that there are journalists stationed there all the time, and there's a bureau there in the way that there isn't in most other countries. Of the, the, so there are a whole series of structural factors, which means that this report gets on the news a lot more. But I completely take your point. It is very, very challenging to think how you actually, within the, the very, very narrow constraints sometimes of a short bulletin, of how you actually filter in um, context into that and how the late Brian Hanrahan now actually said this is a challenge for us and we do, but we do need to think about how to actually feed in this context and how to make this more intelligible. I think one of, one of the other problems that journalists sometimes have is that I think it's sometimes referred to as the kind of I've joined this story halfway through. You sometimes have to, you know when you sometimes watch a long running series and they give you that kind of in last week's episode this, in some ways I think the journalists need to step back a little bit and kind of, not necessarily each day but sometimes during a conflict, kind of step back and sort of say, okay we're going to give you a quick sort of minute segment on how we actually came to this point. Because a lot of the people we spoke to, ordinary members of the public, felt like I felt sometimes like I was tuning in halfway through a film and I didn't know what had gone on before and it just meant, it just made all... The, and the journalists spoke like we had a level of understanding that, that we don't. And we found that very con confusing. But what we also found paradoxically, is not really paradoxically, but on the other side, is when you did give people a little bit of information, so you let people know that there was a war, in nine, a bitter war in 1948 and 1967, people would go, oh, now I see. Now I begin to see, because you give me a bit of the background, how all the pieces fit together. And why it's so deep-seated yes, on both sides. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 just want to, I just want to share a, a little story with you. I worked for 10 years at the World Service um, where international news was a you know was just a, a, a given a part of the, the DNA of every journalist who works there and I moved over to television um, 10 years after I'd been at the World Service and I went to a meeting during which they showed us films of, with focus groups who would you know they'd done the BBC had done some, some of their own research about um, the way in which the audience relate to a foreign story and they showed us lots of little segments of um, very well-known correspondents doing foreign stories some on mostly on development issues and every single focus group member said I didn't understand that I really didn't get it and the final analysis showed that the sorts of stories that we do on foreign news have to be very similar to the way in which Newsround do their stories for young people and and it's when you do stories in that very very simple way on television people tend to understand them and that and that obviously shocked a lot of the people in the audience who all saw themselves as you know very uh, you know worldly intelligent serious people and they were like well you know what do you want us to do you want us to spell it out and that was a real revelation absolutely and, but, but, but what I wanted to ask you, I, I, when in the middle of you talking, I, it did occur to me two things I want to ask you. What did, the, um, what did the broadcasters make of your research, first of all? And secondly, what did the Israelis, you mentioned the kind of, you know, the Israeli publicity machine. Uh -huh. What did the Israelis make of it? Because I started by saying that, that there is a perception, certainly inside the BBC, and we see it virtually every time someone like Mark Ragev comes on and is interviewed about a particular incident, he very often accuses the BBC of being pro-Palestinian. Mm -hmm. so, so give me a sense of what the reaction was from the broadcaster's point of view and from the key players on, on each side to your research. Um, well, certainly from the broadcaster's point of view, it was, was a little bit defensive. Roger Mosley um, wrote a... And a, a letter in the, um, the actually I think a comment. So he was piece the head of the, news at the time yes. when you were doing the research. Uh, one of the things he said to us, well, you know, you, you did you did a fair bit of your audience research with you know young people, and they're a very difficult group to actually, um, you know, to, to actually engage. to engage. Which which is that's a fair point. They are a difficult group to engage. And he also said, well, you know, they can always go to the BBC website if they feel there isn't enough context, or they can watch it. <laughs> they can watch a documentary. And our Excellent. point was, you know, generally speaking, most people won't do that. I mean. You, there is a, you know, you have a segment of the population who will do that, who are very, very interested, who will, you know, they'll, they'll tune into documentaries, they'll do background reading people on this. People in this audience, no Absolutely, doubt. Absolutely, because obviously all, you, all the people who've come down here today are really interested in, in, in the subject. But for, the, for your average viewer at home, they want... They want to get it from the news, and, and they, they, they will probably sit most nights in, in front of the news. And you know, there's been an awful lot of, of talk about the fragmentation of the audience and multi-platforms and all this. But you know, 
the actual audience for BBC and ITV that the main evening bulletins has held up actually remarkably well. And this really is... In the is face of Twitter and... Et cetera, absolutely. Et cetera, yeah. and, and it's still the kind of key source of information for most people about what's going on in the world. So what goes on there is absolutely crucial. And you can't really kind of abrogate your responsibilities to inform people because the BBC and ITV make a big play about how they have this enormous responsibility to inform and how they're so keen to actually do this. In terms in terms of the Israelis, I think, I think the Israelis read, read the report and I think they kind of took on board a lot of the messages. Um, certainly the, the Israelis have done an enormous amount of audience research in terms of how to actually phrase, um, how to phrase their arguments and how to pitch their arguments in order to make them appeal to different audiences. And there are key things that you do. You have a message, you have a high status spokesman who speaks good English, and you repeat the same message over and over and over again, and you make sure that you um, get on and you have a clear message. And you also make sure that you understand how to um, pitch arguments in certain directions. Now, we had a certain document that, that came into um, our possession that we, we came across on the internet, which was produced by the Israeli Project, which is an Israeli lobbying group. And it was produced by, I think, Frank Lutz, who was uh, a, uh, a, pollster a pollster for the, yeah. uh, the, the Republicans. And, um, I mean, he is he's absolutely the creme de la creme in terms of research. And this research was absolutely astonishing. And it gave you a do's and don'ts and, and which words to use and which arguments to use um, in terms of if, if you were, if you were a Jewish person and you wanted to try and put the case for Israel and, and you were debating with somebody and, and the level of the sophistication of, of the arguments and the research was really staggering and it, and it, and it was absolutely brilliant and we have to you know you, you have to take your hat off to the level of professionalism about this research but certainly I think the Israelis read our, our, our research and, um, and when we did the second stuff on the Gaza war and we showed um, the fact that the Israeli perspectives were so much more heavily featured than the Israeli and the Palestinian perspectives on the reasons behind the conflict, their own research showed exactly the same thing, interestingly enough. So their research was actually showing um, exactly the same as, uh, as what our research was, and it was probably also saying exactly the same in terms of... Um, what it actually said about who had actually won the propaganda war over that conflict. Interestingly enough, when, when we did this, this research here, the BBC actually commissioned research from both Loughborough and Cardiff um, on their portrayal of the conflict, and it actually um, came up with exactly the same findings that we did in terms of levels of audience understanding and actually the nature of what was and what wasn't in, um, in the coverage. It is, it's a really big issue for, for the Palestinian side, the, the, the lack of, I mean, it's changing, but the, over, over a period of time, the lack of spokesmen who speak English that, that allows them to put forward the message in, a, in the way that the Israelis clearly have, have decided they, they, they know they want to do and they've done it. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, particular, I, mean I think they've improved a little bit um, recently. Um, they now have speech, spokesmen who do actually speak clear English, but you can't express how important when you're speaking to an international audience particularly if you can be interviewed in a, in a high status setting in a you know if, if you have the opportunity to be interviewed in, in a newsroom or I mean one of the problems we found in the Intifada is that a lot of the Palestinian interviews were were conducted down a crackly phone line to Ramallah and that has a whole different status in, in terms of how that comes across to the audience and one of the other key problems for the Palestinians was that Yasser Arafat during the time before his death when he was still dominant um, tended to have his cronies around him and these were the people who were used as his spokespeople mm. these, these people spoke poor English they, they couldn't get their point across clearly um, and, and they just didn't have a sophisticated public relations output. And when you speak to journalists about the Israeli side, they say, you know, the Israeli side are, are bombarding with press releases they're every day. Yeah. They're, they're organised. And if you have effective public relations, this can serve to kind of drive the news agenda. And it's, and it's very, it's, it's a very, very, I can't overestimate what a key aspect it is in actually influencing the actual uh, agenda of um, international news organisations. I've got lots more questions, but I'm sure people in the audience have as well. And I'm very mindful of the time. So um, there are roving microphones. Um, please put your hand up. Take part. Lady in the front. Um, yes, I'd like to respond very briefly or to comment. Of course. Can I have a microphone? I'm just trying to figure it out. 
Um, good evening. Um, Miss Iqbal, she mentioned pressure brought to bear from both camps, the Palestinian and the Israeli camp for um, Their fairness. Respective for maybe, fairness. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yet there, you failed to mention the pressure brought to bear by the Israeli embassy. I especially remember during the Gaza invasion and massacre that journalists with the BBC actually said they weren't really free to report what they saw or um, report fairly because they actually lived in fear of the telephone call from the Israeli embassy. Also, I would dispute your, uh, your assertion that the situation is contentious. Um, Israel co um, constantly breaks international laws and countless UN resolutions and yet you assert that this is contentious. There's nothing really contentious about that. And these are my comments. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the gentleman up there, just. Um, I just want to um, say about um, Israel regularly breaks UN law. I, think, I don't think they're alone in doing that. I'm not saying it's right or acceptable, but I don't think they're the only people who do that. And I think that um, uh, there are plenty of other uh, countries, such as the United States, in different circumstances, who, who break UN conventions. Um, my other point would be, my other question is actually for both of you, um, do you think, you've mentioned, we talked about the backstory and the background and the history, and you mentioned, you know, there was a bitter war in 1948, which is, of course, the time when, um, just followed on from the time when uh, the actual territory was given to both, the promise to both the Israelis and the Palestinians by uh, the UK. Do you think there's any coincidence that we are struggling to report this situation because we're actually quite involved in that backstory and in the history. I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. I think that it's an interesting use of the word struggling to report it. I mean, I, you know, I, I think every BBC journalist would argue that they, their, their job is to try and be as objective as possible. Now, it's clear from the research that, that, that Mike has outlined that that doesn't always happen because, because because of the selection, the kind of use of language, it, it can very often result in a, a way of portrayal of a story that, that ends up feeling partial as opposed to impartial. But I, I don't know if you want to say something about the, because you know, it's, it, in, in what you, the question you're asking would go back not to 1948, but actually to 1919 and the British Mandate, <laughs> which is going back even further. And and you know, a lot of journalists would argue. We're sent out, as a foreign correspondent, you're sent out, or as a reporter anywhere, you're sent out to report the story that you see on the ground on that day with as much context as it's possible for you to do in the two and a half minutes that, that you're allotted. So, I, you know, I think it's a really, really, it, it's not an impossible ask, but it's a really, really difficult big ask. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I'm not sure that... I mean, it's difficult to say. I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to answer the question about how Britain's obviously long involvement in, in, in the conflict, particularly obviously in the period after um, the First World War when it was assigned, it was effectively given um, control of those territories and um, it made effectively these two promises, one to the people um, who, who, who formed the overwhelming majority, um, the Arab population, and also to... Um, to um, the Jewish population, a lot of whom had actually immigrated there relatively recently over the, the period from 1881. Um, it's difficult to actually assess um, if it's due to kind of... Um, I think it's probably unlikely that that's one of the key factors that it structures coverage. I think it's much more to do with the things that I've outlined, um, things such as public relations, things such as um, pressure, um, and uh, the complexity of the, the, the story, the inability to, to provide context in limited amounts of time, but also to a certain degree by the, the, by the closeness 
of, of, of Britain to American foreign policy and the fact that um, you know American foreign policy is pretty much squarely behind one of the one of the actors in the conflict and the fact that Britain is so closely aligned to America and particularly during the time that we looked at this during Tony Blair's premiership that um, particularly the new Labour government under Tony Blair was seen as being very very um, close to the Israeli government I think that that is, is, is a much more significant factor in actually influencing the climate under which journalists operate. Gentleman here. Thank you. Just, uh, just um, this opens up a, a debate, doesn't it? I mean, you, you pointed out um, correctly that it seems to be one side in terms of the quality, for example, of reportage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Israelis' performance in giving out um, news. Um, you know, uh, things in their favour, let's face it, and, uh, and also that of the Palestinians as a direct contrast there, so that then begs the question. Um, I was privileged some years ago in the 80s to actually attend a, a workshop given by Geoffrey Lean, amongst others, in how, to, how the Green Movement could balance out some of the reportage uh, given out by, uh, in mainstream news, um, held at Dartington and uh, Schumacher Colleges. Um, in the West Country. I was just wondering whether there were any, um, any parallel or recent developments, this has been raised before of course regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, to rectify, if I put it that way, the situation or at least balance it more. What's happening? <laughs> Well, one person who's attempted to do this, and this is somebody you probably, Raz, I haven't asked her, but you're probably aware of, uh, you know, Jake Lynch? Mm. I mean, Jake Lynch is a BBC correspondent who's actually produced videos, I mean, who's tried to kind of question the kind of predominant structure of what he describes as war reporting. And he said, you need to kind of step back and do reporting in a different way. And rather than just reporting on the kind of immediate violence, you have to sometimes step back and try to contextualise why... Um, the two sides got. And he said what's also very, very important, he says a lot of the reporting actually presents it as being two monolithic blocks who are completely opposed to each other, when actually it's actually a lot more complicated than that. You have different, different constituencies in each side. And you actually have... <coughs> It's unfortunately shrunk in the last decade, but you actually uh, certainly used to have quite a, a strong part of the Israeli left, which was actually very critical of the, of the state's policies. But from watching the news, you would get the impression almost that all Palestinians hated the Israelis and all Israelis hated the Palestinians, and there were these two monolithic blocks. When actually he suggested, you know, you should concentrate more on people who are actually trying to resolve the conflict. There are um, Israeli women who go to checkpoints and who serve on things like Checkpoint Watch to, to make sure the try and present Palestinians being mistreated there. And so he says you, you need to try to break down the nature of how the, 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 two, the two sides are seen and also to try and just not just fun function on the conflict but also try to look at um, constructive ways out of conflict and that it shouldn't just be fo focused on daily acts of violence but you should try and find more constructive ways of reporting. I think the work was, was based on... Um, What's the chap's name? Um, I've forgotten. He was, there is a, a sort of a, a big kind of academic um, kind of tradition of peace studies, but it's based around that. And there are people who are trying to suggest different ways of reporting which can get you out of this particular kind of what he describes as a kind of war um, conflict paradigm. But it's whether you can do that in the context oh, of a absolutely. short news bulletin. Yeah. You, know, you, can, you can do it in all sorts of other platforms in absolutely. documentary form and, and telling people, ordinary people's stories and, and finding common ground in terms of the sense of loss and, and what happens when you bury a sense of loss on either side. You know, absolutely. if you've got children being lost on both sides, you know, how you talk about that. But that doesn't necessarily make it easier to do that in a, in a kind of very, very conventional, very structured news um, environment. Well, that's maybe why we need to kind of think a little outside bit outside the box, the box yeah, and no, think about enough. if there is different ways. I mean, I've never seen a report on the BBC hardly about the refuseniks and the fact that there are, you know, there is a constituency in Israel which mm. is uncomfortable with yeah, it was a fantastic way. documentary on Channel 4 about the, um, about the, the, the Israeli soldiers who yes. decided that they really could not be part of, of the state structure that was doing things that they you know, found were, were morally reprehensible. I wonder if you think, though, that there has been, it seems to me that there has been a, um, a shift 
in, in public awareness and knowledge, despite what your report and your research shows. Because in the 1960s and 70s, you know, young people from this country routinely went to Israel to mm -hmm. work on and live in kibbutzim. And, and now they just don't. You know? And there are far more young people who are um, sympathetic to the Palestinian cause in a way that just wasn't the case in the 60s and the 70s. I think there may be some high-profile people at universities and demonstrations, but certainly amongst the general population, that's not what we found. So when we look, mm. for instance, and ask people, you know, who was to blame for the Gaza war, most of the people either said the two sides were equally to blame or else it was the Palestinians. Mm. Interesting. More questions. Um, guy in the front and then the lady in the second row. Yeah. Um, my name's Tony Simpson. Um, I wanted to pay tribute, first of all, to the exhibition upstairs, which I think tells a story which not many of us knew um, before it arrived, about the story about Palestinian parliament and where it is in Jerusalem and the rest. And really, if there was an opportunity for a, a, sto a, a TV story or a radio story on any broadcaster, um, then that might be appropriate uh, for such a story. But I also wanted to register a protest, which is that... Um, um, the Gaza onslaught, Christmas 2008 into 2009, was bracketed at one end by Christmas. They didn't start bombing until the day. And it had to be finished before President Obama was inaugurated in the United States. So we had four weeks of dreadful onslaught, merciless killing, crimes of indescribable horror. And then Mark Thompson, refused to issue the International Appeal for Humanitarian Aid. Um, and it was his decision... By the Disasters Emergency Committee, Indeed, yeah. which is an independent body. And really, you know, to his eternal shame, uh, and to the BBC Trust's eternal shame, I think, they went along with that. Um, Mohammed al Baradai refused to speak to the BBC after that. And I think he had a point. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the lady, or no, the gentleman. Sorry. Hi, I just want to say hi and thank you very much. And I think your research is really, really interesting. And just as a viewer of the TV, just as a little aside, but without extensive research, I find myself so often just having to turn over with the phrases, always Israel retaliated, Israel responded. And it doesn't take more time, or there's no excuse for that. But, but what I was going to ask you was, you said about how the broadcasters and the Israelis responded to your research. I think it's a little bit ironic, <laughs> given this discussion. You haven't told us how the Palestinians responded to your research. Well, obviously, so how did they? <laughs> the, 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 the Palestinians um, liked the fact that we'd obviously showed um, the fact that there were these imbalances in coverage. Um, you know, and, and people... I mean, at the end of the day, I'm an academic. My job is not to kind of propagandise for any side. My, my, my job is to go there to do the research. I mean, this is standard social science methodology and just to report what we find. So, so my job is kind of to report what we find in terms of that and bring that into the public domain. And certainly, obviously, the Palestinians, you know, I mean, a lot of people contacted and said what you've said, that essentially that we'd felt this for a long time, but we were glad that somebody had actually done this in a systematic manner and actually presented their findings. Has there been the potential for Palestinians to be empowered by this kind of research well, in terms of their communication with the BBC, ITV? I'm just, I, and I, I'll question a few things you said. I think there, there is morality behind all social science research. I don't believe it's ever neutral. So I'll, I'll say, I don't think the BBC can be morally neutral on this. So I think they should be active. How is it, are people empowered? to get their point across equally. You've said the Palestinians aren't as skilled as the Israelis. How, how is this research being used, and Palestinians being empowered with this research and other information, to be listened to better? It's, it's not neutral. I don't believe research is neutral. What I mean is we're trying not to endorse a particular view on the conflict. Our job is to kind of research and talk about what we particularly find. My, my job is not to wave the flag for the Israelis or the Palestinians. My job is to actually go out there and do the research and report what we actually find. And we are trying to present the research as, as, as neutrally as possible. It's up to other people to draw the conclusions. I also think messages tend to be more... I think messages tend to be more have more resonance when they're not very polemical as well. 
if you set out to obviously kind of, you know, I mean, if you set out to prove a point, it obviously looks like you're waving the flag for one side or another, and that's not what we set out to do. As I say, we, we set out to be just to research what we found, to speak to ordinary members of the public and just report what we found. In, in terms of the Palestinians, I can't say how much our, our research is actually affected. In terms of the BBC, in terms of the period between when we started in 2001 and the Gaza War in 2008, 2009, not much had changed, unfortunately. I mean, we gave evidence to the BBC impartiality review, and you know, we've written articles, we've, we've, we've tried to you know, make it very, very clear that we think that there are imbalances here, and that the BBC, if it... Um, has a if it, if it claims a mandate to inform and to educate people and also to provide balance that at the moment it's not providing balance in terms of the fact that the Palestinian view on the conflict just just isn't featured to anywhere near the degree that the Israeli perspective is featured but in terms of, of directly sort of saying what effect it's had on the kind of public relations output of the two the, the two sides I'm afraid I can't give you a kind of definitive answer on that I'm afraid the gentleman in the in the middle there, and then sorry, who had their hand up over there? Okay, you next. Uh, was there any reason why you omitted Channel Four news broadcast from your research, given that it's a good fifty minutes every night, and their stories do tend to be longer and in some depth? Um, we did actually, we did actually look as a kind of point of comparison to Channel Four, and we actually did find that the Channel Four. Um, reports did actually tend to feature more of the Palestinian perspectives than the BBC ones, and they did actually seem to be more balanced. Um, though that wasn't a kind of centre point. Oh, we, we concentrated mainly on on ITV and BBC, but we also did look at Channel Four, and we did find certainly there was a greater degree of balance on Channel Four. And likewise, I would I would add, you know, have you done any research on national newspapers? Because there is at least one national newspaper who's reporting on Palestinian issues uh, uh, covers all the things that you've said that uh, the BBC and ITV tend to miss out. There is, but it's not. it has quite a large influence, but it's only a relatively small readership. I assume you're referring to The Guardian. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's it, okay. It's not the the Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> They all read The Guardian. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you uh, whether... whether um, I, you know, I don't know if you've started to do any research, whether the, um, the advent of Al Jazeera has made an impact on, on the way in which the, the conflict is, is now covered. Um, I can't speak because I don't have the research on how it's actually affected the main broadcasters in Britain, ITV and BBC. But certainly Al Jazeera provides a very, very different perspective on the conflict that's much more rooted especially the Arabic version, in the kind of views of the people in that region. The, the, obviously, the English language version is much more um, tailored towards an international audience, so it, so it has a different focus because it's, it's trying to attract a different audience. Um, but the sensibility that they present, even in, in Al Jazeera, I mean, I don't speak Arabic, but I watch the English channel regularly, uh -huh. and, it, and it seems to me that the sensibility that they present, even for, as you say, an international audience, is in marked contrast oh, to what British absolutely. broadcasters do. Absolutely. I mean, there's also fundamental differences in the way Al Jazeera, and one of the things you notice very, very much when you look at Al Jazeera broadcasting is um, the graphicness of some of the broadcasts. I mean, it's something that the BBC and, and ITV are very, very careful about showing. Um, you know, it's about what's acceptable as exactly well as in, culturally, I suppose. What's well. seen as uh, taste and decency yeah. and what can be shown. But certainly Al Jazeera... Um, it is just, it's just radically different in terms of in terms of how it approaches it, in terms of how it approaches the conflict. There is much more emphasis on kind of the uh, the Palestinian and kind of the wider Arab perspective on the conflict. Though they still at the same time um, have Israeli spokespeople on to interview them because they are interested in actually portraying themselves as as as, as not an organisation that just presents one side of the story that is trying to be balanced. And obviously Al Jazeera. Um, did actually take on a number of BBC journalists, I believe, when Quite it a lot. started. <laughs> from the BBC <laughs> Quite serious Arabic hemorrhaging, service, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, absolutely. I'd be very interested to talk to some of the BBC journalists who actually, in this area, to ask them that particular question, whether they feel that the rise of, of um, 
Al Jazeera in particular, its penetration now into in, into the UK and, and to a lesser extent into the United States, whether that's changed their view of how they actually feel they actually have to report the conflict. I think that's a very interesting question. Very interesting. Uh, more questions. I think we've got time for the gentleman just up there. Uh, I am. Uh, I was born in the West Bank, and uh, I just watched the reports on BBC, ITV, Channel 4, and Channel 5, and then Sky News. Now, I find it very unjust the way it's reported, uh, because uh, most of the time they don't report what's happening on the ground. Like every day in the West Bank, Israel enters the West Bank, which is uh, a government ruled by Mahmoud Abbas, who is recognized internationally as a head of state. They enter every day, and they capture people and take them. About, on average, about 10 to 15 people every day. But that is totally not uh, broadcasted on the, any of the media in this country. And now the second thing, now they go to Gaza and they kill people. And whenever they report it in the news, they say they killed uh, six people uh, from Hamas, the militant group. They always got to add the word militant. It's, you know, it is uh, for, you know, uh, they, we feel that it is the news is just totally against the Palestinian and very pro-Israeli. Well, that's certainly what, what Mike's research has, has borne out as well. Um, I don't really know what to say about that, to be honest. Um, I, think, I think one of the issues, as Paul Adams said, the BBC correspondent, unless there's a lot of blood, there's an immediate event with a number of people being killed, they just don't report it. And so one of the things that we found, and this kind of conclude, concurs with what you said, is the daily living conditions of Palestinians, what it means to be living under occupation, the fact that you can't leave your village, the fact that you have to have a, 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 an ID card that you have to show, the fact that there are checkpoints, the fact that these basic things that hugely impact on people's ability to live a normal life, they're largely absent from coverage, and I, w I would absolutely agree with you. That is what we found when we looked at the coverage. Uh, 648 checkpoints in areas smaller than maybe Yorkshire, or even maybe Nottinghamshire. Gentleman in the front, and then the lady just there. Hi. Um, thank you again for a great discussion. Um, my question to Mike and maybe Razia would like to comment as well is um, clearly there's a lot of factors going into the reasons why there's such disparity between the reality on the ground and the coverage, um, at least the, the BBC and ITV coverage you look, you've looked at. And my question is to how much or to, to what extent is this, um, can, be this can this be traced to um, maybe this sort of identification not with one side as ours and the other side as another, you know, some sort of neo-orientalist sort of view of the conflict as the, the Palestinians. Yeah. yeah, the Palestinians are the other side. And these, so even if the journalist sort of, um, you know, tries to be objective, they, you know, without maybe realizing it, they, they sort of internalize the, the conflict as uh, one side that is more or less of people like us Mm -hmm. i.e. the Israelis, Western-minded people who talk like us, who think and, and sort of um, can be seen to represent people who look like us, and, and the Palestinians who are alien, who are strange and talk differently, and therefore it's easier for people to, you know, in, in their reportage to, to sort of, sh you, know, sing, you know, slip into this sort of... Uh -huh. That's a very difficult very question to answer. I can't answer that question in, in any kind of... Way. It was actually when we did the focus groups, one of the people who sat in on our focus groups, because he was interested in exactly that question, was the filmmaker Ken Loach. He was interested to know, do people feel more of a cultural affinity to these people because they're seen as being more westernised? If you have a Palestinian um, who, who looks slightly different, whose who's, who's, you know, who's, who's, who's cultural behaviour may be slightly more removed... And, uh, and less likely to speak English yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. That, yeah. Does that mean we feel less empathy for those people? He was very he was fascinated by that question. If somebody appears culturally different, is, is there, does that sense of difference mean that we, we lose that sense of empathy with them? Um, that's a very, very difficult question to answer. I'm afraid I don't have the answer for that. But it is certainly something um, to think about. I mean, I think there may be... 
a certain degree to which, but I mean, actually, you know, I'm, I'm not really prepared to speculate. But it, on doesn't that. it go to the heart of, of what you were saying about research not being neutral? I mean, we, we approach, ev you know, ev our daily lives in our relationships with everybody. We come with a certain set of perceptions, perspectives, baggage, and so you could argue, and it's a it's a different debate, but I think it's possible to to argue cogently on both sides that that it's not possible to have objective news. That it really is not. Possible. Possible. There is no such thing. You can aspire to it. You can you can say we're going to put certain things in place that make it possible for us to pursue the truth or pursue perhaps not even the truth. Pursue um, an ideal where we present both sides. But but because of all those things, because of the way in which human dynamics works, it's not possible that the selection of stories. If you look at any news bulletin on any given day, a different editor may choose a different selection of stories or choose a different um, set of people to comment on them. You know, if you if you're if you're casting a particular discussion, a different editor might cast it very differently. Because because we all come with, you know, so, so I, I think it is a really, really interesting issue, but, but it's not, and, and it's relevant clearly here, because what you're asking is, is, is it really possible to be objective when, when you come from a particular sensibility? You know, if, 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 is it only possible for, say, Al Jazeera to present the Palestinian side because they are predominantly an Arab outfit, or they come from that sensibility. They come, from, you know, and, and, and is, it o is it only ever going to be the case that Western news organisations are always going to be biased towards one side or the other because they're Western news organisations? I, mean, I don't have the answer to those questions, but I think, I think it's relevant, definitely. Um, there was a hand there. Um, yeah, that was... Um it's all been very interesting and the, um, the figures and the examples on there. And um, yeah, I'm thinking that um, there was a lot of examples of Islamophobia in there, you know, referring to terrorists and so on. And that actually we see that in the press around all themes. You know, there was, um, when I, I listened to the news quiz um, last week and there was as a lot of stuff about, I've forgotten his name, um, speaking in public, but the um, Muslim preacher. There was a lot of jokes Abu about Abu Qatada. Yeah, jokes about his name and this kind of thing going on. And um, and I do think that um, it's a reflection of the Islamophobia in our culture. And what what I think is quite interesting is that um, I'm a white Gentile and um, <clears throat> and not Muslim. And um, that, you know, we, we didn't get much of a mention in that. It's like the Israeli perspective um, against the Palestinian perspective. Uh, but the, the press is the kind of Western, white Gentile press, the culture. That is the, um, the dominant culture. And so it's going to um, produce our dominant kind of prejudices. It's going to come up with that. Um, and I also think that um, what... what yeah, and I think that what, what happens is that um, that's how the conflict is presented, that it's the Israelis against the Palestinians. It's these two groups, you know, for Gentiles, you know, they're, they're both a bit dodgy and um, they're in conflict and they can't sort it out and that somehow we haven't got any responsibility. And, and even that, like, you know, the press are somehow victims of the Israelis because they're getting hassled to put a certain kind of view across. And actually, you know, what I... What I think is that, you know, if we look outside the dominant perspective, it is like who benefits from this conflict? And it's the Western economies that benefit from the conflict because, you know, it provides uh, NATO with a base in the Middle East in a really strategic area. And so, you know, while that conflict's going, the West has more power in that area. And, and if there was peace in that area, you know, if um, Israelis and Palestinians uh, were, were together and united, then um, that would cause difficulties uh, for the West. And I think the setup reflects um, the anti-Semitism of, um, of our culture, which is that, you know, historically for years and years, uh, Jews have been allowed into a country to take a middle agent role, um, to, to stand between the ruling classes and the working classes. And then when the working classes have got pissed off, um, 
the ruling classes have put the attention on the Jews who are the money lenders and collecting rent and so on and the working classes have turned against the Jews and this dynamic is similar in the Middle East that um, you know a middle agent role is being played there for the benefit of the West and so we, ne we need to be able to you know if we're going to get rid of that conflict and, and put a proper perspective we need to kind of hold both peoples and um, you know, hold both people's perspectives, but not set them up against each other, but um, look at what perspective we are pushing and how we're benefiting from it. Thank you. Uh, Mike, certainly when the Glasgow Media Group started their investigations um, in, in media coverage, power structures was very much one of the things that, that, that they looked at, right? Yeah, you've been doing your research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, obviously I wasn't involved in the early work back in the mid-70s, but, um, you know, one of the key things we were interested in, you talked very interestingly there about how, um, you know, on any given day a, a news editor might use different sources. One of the key things you find when you look at historically over a long period of time is that certain kinds of sources tend to predominate. And certainly an institution like the BBC will structure its coverage around what it sees as an acceptable range of debate. And that tends to be because of the constitutional settlement in this country and where the BBC sits within that, that it tends to be the spectrum of opinion that's at Westminster. And it's difficult. I mean, you can see it most clearly in question time where you kind of you've got one blue, one red, and, and, and one yellow, and then maybe a couple of mavericks. But there is that sort of sense that, um, you know, important people, you know, official sources, and there's lots of them, unfortunately, research that's, that, that backs this up, that essentially a, a lot of the media is kind of a, a conversation amongst people who have power um, and, and kind of high-status official sources, and these can come to be primary definers who actually kind of um, structure and um, talk and, and set the parameters for debate. I mean, I'm actually doing some research um, on the Today programme and the reporting of the banking crisis, one of the most interesting things you find is that during the banking crisis, the main people who are the spokesmen for the, who, who actually came to define the crisis were the bankers and the hedge fund managers themselves. And if you want to get critical um, opinions about the, the nature of the financial sector and its maybe malign role in the UK economy, the people you don't really want to get on to talk about that are the bankers. So by choosing <laughs> certain sort of pe people as, as, your, as your range of sources, you can delimit opinion. And, and, and the range of sources that you actually have on television is very, and, and obviously on radio and on different forms of media, can be very, very significant in kind of um, narrowing the range of debate that you actually have. One last question, I think. Okay, two. The guy there, and then the guy there. And then we're going to have to wrap it up. Hi. Uh, you mentioned um, Israel and Palestine being the centre of the three main religions. In your research, did any of that come out in terms of obviously stoking the conflict, but then how it is reported as well? Yes. Uh, sorry, and then there is sorry. a second question. <laughs> uh, and the second question is, um, it's gone now, no. second question, uh, you talked about obviously a balance in reporting and how that reporting could contribute to re uh, resolving the conflict. But why do you think a balance of reporting would resolve the conflict? Because it, it's not it's, it's not about reporting. Okay, That's a great question. Two, two two questions there. Okay, um, the, the 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 first question. Sometimes there was occasions where religion would be provided as an explanation for why the two sides were fighting over the particular holy sites. And sometimes it would be explained in religious terms, both on the Palestinian side and on the Israeli side. So sometimes that was an explanation for when it was usually done in a very kind of brief and often oblique way, but that sometimes that did arise as, as an explanation for the conflict, that there was a, a strong religious dimension to it. Probably actually more of that that you found than the nationalist dimension, which is kind of interesting in itself. Um, on, on, on the second question, I think the key thing is here is, if there's no public debate, then there's no pressure on governments to actually pursue policies that actually are pro-peace. You have to have a debate in order to create some uh, degree of public knowledge and then to create pressure on the people in government to actually pursue policies that are actually liable to end the conflict. Because I think without that public debate, there's absolutely no pressure on the particular politicians to actually make moves that might actually resolve the conflict. So I think the media is absolutely critical in this in terms of providing people with 
perspectives and to providing people with understanding about how the various different dimensions of the conflict and how it might actually be resolved. But saying that, just the fact that the ad has been going on so long and been reported for so long, why do, why do you still think balanced readers will resolve it? Um, I'm not saying that it's the only thing or that it will automatically resolve it, but I think it will help. I mean, I, 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 I just think having an informed population on any particular issue does affect the dynamics of political decision-making. And when people become more aware um, of, of the various complexities and what's actually going on and the various potential solutions, that changes the dynamic in which political actors actually operate. Gentlemen. Uh, hi, hi, hi. Yeah, I want to challenge the issue of way how the the of the the latest issue of 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 the debate of 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 how the PPC is going along with the Israeli line that 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 actually Iran wants to to build nuclear weapons and 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 and, and wipe it off the face of 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 of, of the earth, for instance. Um, um, it's how how they've also our politicians so uh, are part of the brain as well. How they've twisted language um, 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 because the Israeli, the Iranians have said they never had uh, uh, threatened actually, actually Israel military tour unless unless Israel actually attacks Iran. They said they would. They they would well, they would actually respond, but 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 it seems to be uh, the whole political establishment seems to be going by the Israeli line. Well, we're certainly seeing a, a serious ra uh, ratcheting up of the propaganda war on both sides, there, aren't we? I believe I saw one of one of the um, reports from one of the kind of strategic defence intelligence reports that they thought there was a 50% chance of um, war by April and a 60% chance of war by September. And also understand that um, there's been a number of um, financial bets taken on what they call fat tails on, on the price of oil. One, that it will fall because of the, um, the fact that they believe there's going to be a lot of um, new um, oil coming on, on stream over the next 12 months, particularly in the United States, with particular forms of deep oil drilling. And secondly, the fact that there's, so there's bets taken that the price of oil might fall because of that and also uh, slow down in the world economy. But also, um, bets taken on there's going to be a big spike because there's, there's, there's really a strong anticipation that there is likely to be a war um, in the Middle East. Um, and nobody really quite knows the consequences of that, but obviously it could be extremely serious. On that incredibly pessimistic note, uh, we, we are going to have to uh, call it a day. Um, I'd like to thank um, Mike Berry very much indeed uh, for his research and for talking about it so um, cogently. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you all for your great questions and comments. And thank you to the Nottingham Contemporary for having this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much.